The Museum Road Show is brought to you by 125 Apparel. Hi, I'm Kathy Coyle, volunteer with the Becker County Museum. We're here uh, broadcasting from the 65th Western Steam Threshers Reunion. How about that? 65 years ago, and I know the descendants who got it started, the Nelsons, so I kind of have a, a thing in my heart for the Steam Threshers reunion. Patrick Hill has volunteered to tell us about, your son is behind us, he's eight years old, so I feel like history is repeating itself. Uh, you got involved when you were eight. That's correct. I was. My son is eight now. I started when I was eight. He's fortunate because he got to start a lot younger than myself. So he has a lot more knowledge already at eight years old than I had. Um, but that was when I got my start. Was eight years old, and I started here in Miniature Land, um, running the the uh, small engines that are behind us here. Um, and I, as I've always told people, I escaped inside the fence, and they could never get rid of me. And <laughs> at 50 years old I'm still inside the fence and playing with the miniatures as I call it playing with the toys. You uh -huh. beat me to it I was wondering <laughs> how many years had gone by so see uh, 42 years you've been hanging out by the oh, miniatures. Yes. Now when you say miniatures people are gonna scratch their head and wonder what that's about. Uh, tell us about what, what size are these machines compared to the real deal? These are one-third scales that are behind us right now. The, um, the, the Case and the Huber and the Advance are the ones that are sitting behind us, and they are one-third scale replicas of full-size machines uh, that were used for uh, agriculture and lumber sawing um, in, in this area. And one of the founders of the show, Norman Nelson, uh, built the ones that are sitting behind us here. Uh, his first one being this case that's behind us, which case is the uh, feature for this year. Um, and the, uh, he built this machine in 1948. And uh, was, so it was actually built before the show even started. Mm -hmm. um, but he, it was kind of like a toy for them to go out and play with um, because steam was, was being shuttered for the, in favor of the gas tractor. Uh, so they built them and as the show started they became um, a kind of a unique feature piece to the show um, that it gets the kids involved and it's what sparks a lot of that uh, uh, next generation coming up and and staying involved in the in the uh, activity um, and becoming a uh, uh, the next generation to operate the equipment and that's I was very fortunate that way because yeah. no Patrick Let's take a look at what your son is doing here. So what would this machine in real life, when it's, uh, you know, three times the size, what would it be doing on the farm? Well, this machine would have probably been run, operating a thrashing machine in the fall um, to do, uh, to separate grain. Uh, they may have, if depending on the size of the farm, they may have used it for a little bit of plowing. Um, and then if they were in a wooded area, if they had a sawmill, they would probably use it for uh, operating a sawmill uh, during the winter months uh, to put up lumber and uh, as another source of revenue. It sounds like they really got their money's worth out of it then. They would do everything they could because back in those days, the, the, a steam engine was very expensive. A lot of farms didn't own a steam engine and a thrashing machine and the sawmill. The one of the farms would own the thrashing machine. One of the farms would own the set, the the steam engine, and they worked together. So they would, in the case with around here, I know the Nelsons worked a lot with the with the Ockery family, and they did their thrashing together, and uh, as well as the, some of the other far neighboring farms. So they now, If people are getting worried that uh, smoke is rising out of this, it's supposed to be. So your son was feeding it, and as, as soon as I was going to refer to him, he walked away. But get back uh, to work, buddy. And <laughs> so he's putting the, the small wood in, into the, uh, what do you call it? Into the firebox of the, firebox. Of the steam engine. Yeah. Um, so the, the, we're essentially, we're using wood to boil water and the water is is creating or is contained inside to uh, boil into steam and we're pressurizing that and that's what's being used to drive the the motion of the engine um, steam is extremely extremely powerful 
So it made a great source of energy for them to transfer into motion uh, to operate things like a sawmill or a, uh, a thrashing machine. So it, it gave them a, the opportunity to move farther away from, uh, say, a river because they didn't have to rely on a uh, moving water source to drive like a water wheel. All right. And if we could go back in time, I know the Nelsons. So, yep. and we got Nelson Lake real close to Rolog here. And um, Bill Nelson was a professor at NDSU, now retired and living in Iowa, and was one of my mentors. And so, if we can just imagine back in the olden days, then we'd see larger versions of this all over this land. Yes. And uh, their fa the Nelson family, uh, uh, Bill's dad, um, took care of the, the running the separator and Norman the one that operated the uh, or built these steam engines was uh, the one that took care of the, running the thrashing or the uh, steam engine and they obviously worked together to uh, uh, take in the harvest and everything and that was how this show got started was they were the families around this area were sitting down for their noon meal and they were reminiscing about being able to run with the steam engine and how they enjoyed uh, using the, the old Garscott and thrashing with steam. And they decided, well, we're heading back over to the old far, the farmstead where the Garscott is being stored. Let's get it out of the shed and we'll thrash for the day with steam. And that's what this show really started as, yeah. um, was just a bunch of guys getting out the old steam engine just to play for the day. And I didn't really understand it until my relative, the late uh, Raymond Arneson from the Halstead area, took my great-grandfather, Ole Vickers, old steam engine, and restored it. For years and years, he worked on it, spent a lot of money, mm -hmm. and finally got to show it the year before he died, and I got to be in the parade. So I know that feeling of pride you know, and for years I would come here as a reporter and not understand it, but now I totally understand it. And it is. It's. Uh, I also own a, a full-size engine myself now that I was operating for a for a gentleman for many years, and he offered to sell it to me, and I was able to purchase it. Um, it is. It's that there's a, a definitely a passion um, with steam, and you hear the railroaders talk about that of the the romance of of the the engineers and stuff it was very hard work but there was something about steam and it's part of the reason why the why 353 out here at Rolog is is operating and why you look at the different excursion railroads going around the country that have that have brought steam back to play with on the rails um, the the steam traction is the same way there's just something about it it's the way that these engines become alive and the fire is going in them. The, the, the water is boiling. The water is boiling, and the uh, uh, it, it just brings the, uh, the 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 living, breathing machine to life when you light that fire. And it it really reminds you of our own um, heritage of you know try to sustain life. Um, th these engines, we can't let them die. Yeah. Um, it's a huge part of our history. Well, and you've done a great job of, and your son's kind of having a tough time right now with that chimney, but you've done a great job of getting the young people involved. And I've noticed that year after year that people grow up and then they get the gray hair, but they're bringing the younger people in. And, and it, it's something with the, this area that I've we, it was something that a couple of us were sitting around discussing earlier today even of how the the community in this area seems to be able to put on such great events um, and Rolog being one of them or, or Western Minnesota Steam Threshers Reunion being one of them in the fact that no matter wh when that call for help comes out that we need more people to help with uh, something on the train or we need more people to help with pitching bundles um, the the people come out of the woodwork to help with it yeah. and I don't know if it's just to see what we're up to it, even on a rainy day we'll draw a huge crowd here because yeah. people come out to see well gee what are they gonna do at Steamer <laughs> Hill in the rain and the the people come out in droves to see what we're doing and the the more that they they come in and become spectators there's a portion of them that get curious and all of a sudden they become part of the the reunion and and the, the, the machines draw the people together and, and that's where the, the, the word reunion is very strong within this show. Um, Patrick, thank you so much. 
you are enthusiastic. <laughs> And, and his day job is working at UND, running the Chester Fritz. Well, technical director. Technical director. So. so you're having fun. Oh, yes. Yeah. So if you missed uh, all the excitement at Rolog this year, you can come the Labor Day weekend. It's so interesting. It's living history, all different ages, and it's great family entertainment. So keep an eye on what's happening here at Ro Rolog year after year after year. This is Kathy Coyle reporting from the Steam Threshers reunion. Thank you for watching this episode of the Museum Roadshow, brought to you by 125 Apparel.